Thank you everyone for uh, joining. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege that we have so many people joining us for this very interesting talk. I'm uh, going to briefly introduce uh, Professor Ahmed uh, Kuru. Uh, Professor Kuru, he received his PhD from University of Washington and he is currently a professor of political science um, at uh, San Diego State University where he was also the former director of the Center for Islamic and Arab Studies. Uh, Professor Koru was um, a postdoctoral student and scholar um, at the Center for the Study of uh, Democracy, Toler uh, Tolerance and Religion at Columbia University. Professor Koru is also an author of an earlier book, which is titled Secularism and State Policies Towards Religion, the United States, France, and Turkey. Uh, and this book of uh, his received an award uh, from the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion. Uh, we have Professor Kuru with us today for his new incredible book, which is titled Islam, Authoritarianism and Underdevelopment, a Global and Historical Comparison. And this book has just recently been published by Cambridge University Press. I had a chance to read this book myself, um, and it's uh, really, as you'll see, innovative and really a topic which is very important for all of us. Um, this book is gaining traction uh, among the literary circles quite a bit, and most recently, uh, Professor Koru's book became the co-winner of the American Political Science Association International History and Politics Best Book Award. So. Congratulations on that. And really, we look forward to hearing Professor Koru's remarks. And as Pallavi reminded us, after his remarks, we will have uh, an interactive Q&A session. So please you know, keep a record of your questions and type them in as you see them. And then um, I will moderate that session with Professor Koru. So thanks again, uh, uh, Professor Koru, and over to you. Thanks, Professor Mian. It's a pleasure and honor to be in your prestigious webinar series. And I'm grateful to all the Princeton staff and faculty who make this possible. Let me start with the basic question of contemporary problems in 49 Muslim majority countries. I'm a political scientist, not an historian. Therefore, I focus on contemporary problems. But the way to analyze these issues lead me to a historical examination. That's why the subtitle of the book, it is a global comparison looking the problems of violence, authoritarianism and underdevelopment in 49 Muslim majority countries today. It is also a historical comparison to understand the causes of these problems. So I would like to share with you a PowerPoint presentation to starting with the, in the, the, so this is the book with the title Islam Authoritarianism and Underdevelopment. As you see, I did not put violence in the title because when you read the chapter on title, I emphasize that there is very little exceptional in the Muslim world when it comes to violence, which is a broader human problem. But the discussion of violence is important. It is in the media, it is in daily life discussions everywhere. And it leads me and the readers to two problems I try to focus on in the Muslim world, authoritarianism and underdevelopment. And in that particular uh, angle, give us really what makes many terrorist activities, civil wars and interstate wars in the Muslim world. So therefore I take violence as more an effect of authoritarianism and underdevelopment rather than uh, an independent variable itself. That's why I didn't put it in the, the title of the book. So when we look at the so-called Muslim world, many anthropologists and some colleagues criticize me for using this word, Muslim word, but objectively there are Muslim majority, Christian majority, Buddhist majority countries. And 
for, there out of about 200 countries in the world, 49 of them are Muslim majority. And almost all, perhaps all of these countries are members of organization of Islamic cooperation. And they officially recognize themselves as such. And when we look at these countries using Freedom House and Polity data, we see a major gap between these countries and the world average. So I'm not simply comparing Muslim majority countries in average with the Western countries in average. Instead, when you look at the world average in general, we still see Muslim majority countries uh, having disproportionate level of authoritarianism. And in this map, you see 60% of all countries in the world are electoral democracies according to Freedom House. But in the Muslim world, it's only 14%. It's very difficult to analyze this because authoritarianism and democracy in the Muslim world is so rapidly changing. And in a few days, the, 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 the democratic country like Mali may see a coup d'etat and become authoritarian. I've been studying this for about 15 years or so, and always updating my list of democratic countries in the Muslim world because they are very fragile. And if we look at the basic criteria of electoral democracies, it's only 14% versus 60% world average. So what about the socioeconomic development? Again, if we look at the parameters of UNDP and other agencies, in terms of gross national income per capita, Muslim world average, 49 countries have $9,000 average, whereas the world are about 195 countries, 14,000. And this is despite the fact that Muslim countries have 60% of world oil reserves, this is this, despite the fact that some of them have huge GNI per capita based on oil reserves. Then in terms of literacy rate, schooling years, life expectancy, you see that Muslim majority countries average are below than the world average, 73% literacy rate versus 84, 5.8 years versus 7.5, 66 years versus 69 years of life expectancy. So this brings the question why? And in the literature, there are three main answers to this question. One answer is provided by those who are called by critics as Orientalists. And in the political arena, they may be called Islamophobes. I call them essentialists because they try to essentialize Islam, arguing certain theological principles of Islam are compatible with democracy and development. And throughout my book, I take this argument very seriously. In almost each and every chapter, I engage with Max Weber, with Samuel Huntington, with Bernard Lewis, with certain Arab thinkers and poets like Adonis, who blame Islam, Muslim culture, sometimes specific to Arab culture. And I criticize this saying that from the eight to 12th centuries, Muslims had a brilliant achievements, a, a set of brilliant achievements in terms of philosophical and economic progress. Particularly between nine and 11 centuries, they had a golden era. And roughly between eight and 12 centuries, Muslims were superior to Western Europeans in terms of philosophy and economic development. So therefore Islam was perfectly compatible with development. Therefore the essentials arguments have many weaknesses. The second argument, you may have heard it among the streets in the Middle East and among the academic circles of post-colonial, post-modern scholars that it's all about Western imperialism, that Western colonization destroy Muslim institutions, their economic and academic institutions leading to problems today. So again, I take this very seriously. It's an important argument. 
definitely colonization was significant. But at the same time, chronologically, I try to show that the problems in the Muslim world began, the problem of intellectual and economic stagnation began much earlier than Western colonization. And in fact, intellectual and economic stagnation made Muslims weaker and open to be colonized. And in my argument, problems start in mid 11th century in Central Asia, Iraq, Iran, then spread to Syria, today's Palestine and other related areas and Egypt in 12th and 13th centuries. And much before the colonization began, Muslims already had economic and intellectual stagnation. The third argument was neo-institutionalism. So it has been promoted, as you know, by many scholars like Douglas North, more recently, Darana Jamal and his co-authors. And they argue that basically authoritarian and ineffective institutions lead to underdevelopment, whereas more inclusive and effective institutions lead to development, both political and economic. So my critique, so I, I, I'm more friendlier with this argument, but still critical because my critique is that who made the institutions? Are the institutions coming from out of blue or some other planet? No, human beings are creating them, but who are these human beings? Which class of people? Why they built good institutions versus bad institutions? That's the question I try to engage with my own argument. And my own approach differs from the existing literature on several points, but I want to emphasize two of them. One, many books and articles have pointed out the contemporary problems in the Muslim world without sufficiently analyzing the Muslim's golden age. And this is not only academically a problem because it may confuse you when you search for cause and effect relations. If you don't know, or you, if you don't acknowledge Muslims early achievements, you may assume that they are always culturally and politically economically inferior. This is wrong. And normatively also, it may give people to be racist, Islamophobes, etc. So therefore, it's very important for me intellectually, academically to emphasize the early Muslim achievements and make it part of causal explanation. And the second issue I try to do in my own approach and analysis is to compare Muslim world with Western Europe by rejecting the idea of exceptionalism in both cases. So both the Muslim world and Western Europe are normal, nothing unique, nothing miraculous. Of course, each and every individual is unique, but as social scientists, we try to provide arguments and explanations as generalizable as possible. And I argue that in both Muslim world and the Western Europe, maybe someone says the rest of the world, including China, the relationship between four classes for social classes, political class, religious class, intellectual class, and economic class. You may call them state authorities. It's not simply king, it's broader than king queen. It may be janissaries, mamluks, a military oligarchy, but basically state authority, mostly military authorities. Then clergy. It may be Catholic Church, it may be ulama, ulama, plural, alim is singular, basically Islamic scholars, scholars, ulama. In Shia Islam, it is more institutionalized as a clergy. In Sunni Islam, it claimed not to be a clergy, but in reality it is. They are hiding their clergy status with rhetorics, but in reality they are clergy right now. The third is the intellectual class. 
many scholars, philosophers, and very broad notion of intellectuals. And then the fourth is economic class. You may call them a bourgeoisie. Historically, I call them merchants. Some call them proto-bourgeoisie in early Islam. And they explain, so these two classes, the third and fourth, intellectuals and the bourgeoisie, were the engines of Muslims' early achievements between 8th and 12th centuries. And in the book, I analyze how in philosophy and natural sciences, how in economy and militarily, Muslims were very powerful, dynamic, and out of the three, military is insignificant in my analysis. I mention it, but it is a more an effect rather than cause. The important things are intellectual and economic life. And the important issue in this picture, you see the figure, is that we don't have a Western supremacy immediately follow Muslim supremacy. There is a big period, about five centuries of comparable level of development. So that's important because when people hear that I analyze golden age and then decline, they claim that, oh no, there was 12th century scholars. You have, you miss Ibn Rush. There was 14th century scholars. You miss Ibn Haldun. No, I take them very seriously. Ibn Haldun and Ibn Rush and Ghazali are the three scholars I analyze in very much details. Of course, Muslims after mid 11th century continue to produce cutting edge scholarship. But in this interval period between 1200 and 1700, Muslims production was declining. Scholars like Ibn Rush and Ibn Haldun were no longer recognized and appreciated. They were either persecuted or ignored. So, but the point here is that Muslim golden age was not directly followed by Western supremacy. There was a long period that they were comparable. But after 1700, and I give the details in the book, the Western supremacy by Galileo in the early 17th century, and then in around 1750, 1750, the Dutch and English economic uh, take off, show what we have today. The Western countries are economically and philosophically more develop developed than Muslim majority countries. But it was not overnight. It's a long process that Muslim golden age, then comparable, then Western supremacy. So I explain it with class relations. What do I mean by class relations? Until the mid 11th century, around the year 1050, there were independent scholars and merchants who were the motors of Muslim progress. They were then followed by an alliance between the ulama and the military class or the state bureaucracy in general. So who were the independent scholars and what was their relation with the merchants? Basically, by intellectuals, I refer to both Islamic scholars like Abu Hanifa and philosophers like Kharazmi, who was a mathematician, one of the leading Muslim mathematicians who learned Arabic numerals and many other mathematical formulas and tools from India, then developed them, then taught them to Western Europe. Razi, one of the medical scientists of that time who differentiate certain viruses and bacteria like chickenpox and others. Ibn al Haysam, as a scholar of physics, who developed the early model of camera, obscurica, a, modern, uh, a prototype of modern camera we use. Farabi, both a musician and a political philosopher writing an important commentary or an extension of Plato's uh, Republic. And then Ibn Sina as both a religious philosopher, a metaphysical philosopher, political philosopher and medical scientist, a polymath. Biruni as also another polymath who wrote the most important book on India for many centuries 
analyzing Indian religion, language, history, culture. So all these philosophers were part of the golden era and Islamic scholars like Abu Hanifa were also part of it. And in fact, Abu Hanifa and other Islamic scholars distance from the state authority was very important pillar of the Muslim golden era. And I try to argue in my book that the modern cliche that there is no separation between religion and state in Islam is a misleading cliche. Uh, some scholars and people on the street argue that in Christianity, there is a separation between religion and state because uh, Jesus in gospel, Lucas says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, render unto God what is God. But Prophet Muhammad said, religion and state are twins. Religion is the structure state is the guardian that without structure collapse that without guardian perishes so first of all this is a very wrong understanding of christianity because in my first book secularism and state policies toward religion united states france and turkey i documented how the catholic church refused separation until 1964 the Second Vatican Council, and everybody knows that. And in my analysis of friends, I show how the French Catholic Church, inspired by the Pope, struggle against secularism and the idea. And to make this long story short, in 1877, the Pope Pius declared a syllabus of errors, the condemned ideas, damned ideas, including the idea that an individual can select his own religion and the idea of church and state should be separated. So therefore, it, it is not a simple result of gospel and Jesus teaching, but I again examine in my new book, Islam, that in the mid 11th century, a transformation occurred in both Muslim world and Western Europe. In Western Europe, the so-called Gregorian reforms or the papal revolution occurred starting around 1054, then 1075, because of the accidental event that the Pope Gregory tried to assert his domination over the Holy Roman Emperor, Henry IV. Then Henry declared his own superiority over the Pope and Henry I declared that he has the power to appoint the popes. Then the Pope Gregory declared that the emperors shall kiss his feet. So anyhow, the long story and the short conclusion is that it is a historical construct and historical many unintended consequences lead to what we know today, separation of church and state in Christianity. Whereas in the Muslim world, after the Prophet and four Caliphs, there happened a major separation as a result of the fact that Muawiyah, Yezid, and other founding fathers of Umayyad dynasty persecuted the Prophet's family. And they, despite the claim that they define themselves Caliphs, they were kind of secular rulers, quote unquote. Muawiyah, according to Ibn Haldun in Muqaddimah and other scholars emphasizing, Muawiyah was the first in Islamic history who used bodyguards, who used a crown, a throne, symbols of monarchical power, unlike the Prophet and four caliphs who had charismatic personal authorities. And after them, no more, the model of the prophet and four caliphs are not to be repeated. It is exceptional. Today's Islamists understood totally wrong and the model ended. And Umayyads and Abbasis were mostly normal secular political rulers. The exception that proves the rule was Ab Umar bin Abdulaziz, who ruled only two years, the, Abba, uh, the Umayyad Caliphate. And he was recorded the poison by the members of other Umayyad dynasty. 
And this short exception, because he was a pious and Omar bin Abdulaziz was taken very seriously by pious Muslims, but not other Umayyad um, and most Abbasi caliphs. There was a certain level of separation between religious authorities, Islamic scholars like Abu Hanifa and political authorities. And Abu Hanifa was not alone. There were Shafi, Malik, Hanbal, and on the Shia side, Jafar uh, Sadiq, they refused to serve the state. Shafi only when he was young accepted, then he regretted a state position. Abu Hanifa was offered to be a judge by the Abbasi Caliph. He refused, and the Caliph insisted, asking him to provide an excuse, an explanation. Abu Hanifa, he was a silk merchant, and he said that I refuse because I'm not qualified to be a judge. Then the Abbasi Caliph became outraged and said, you are a liar. Then Abu Hanifa replied, a liar can never be a judge. And then the caliph put him in prison and Abu Hanifa was poisoned to death in prison. So the persecution they face became a model taken by other Muslim scholars. And Ibn Hanbal and others declared that receiving money from state is haram, it's not permissible. What is the result? So Kohen provided us detailed result in his 1970 crucial article analyzing 3,900 Islamic scholars between 8th and mid 11th centuries. Only nine of them receive money as state officials. 91% were funded by commerce, industry, or other private jobs. And this, of course, it's not 100%, but 91%, of course, an important percentage. It's very different from what we have in Turkey today. Diyanet as a government agency, about 100,000 imams receiving salaries as state servants. And in many Muslim countries, you have different versions of Diyanet. But it wasn't the case in early Islamic history. And that created enormous level of diversity, dynamism, and intellectual vibrancy the distance Muslim scholars put between themselves and the state authorities. So then, then what happened? What explained the change? The change occurred around mid 11th century. It was a multi-variable, multi-dimensional transformation. Around 10th century, uh, the Abbasi economy, uh, particularly in Iraq, had problems regarding the declining fertility of Iraqi fields. Then Abbasis tried to use the Iqta system of allocating land and land revenue assignments to their officials because of the shortage of cash. Then Buyuts after them adopt this model then Sebchuks after them regarded this ICTA system of land revenue distribution to military officials particularly, very helpful for their military state notion. So this economic transformation was coincided, if not complemented, by the militarization of state structure, which is a parallel transformation began by the Ghaznavids, Mahmoud the Ghaznavi was probably the first initiator of the militarization of state structure. Then Selçuks were a nomadic military force established their empire. Then this model was later embraced by Saladin, his AUB dynasty, which gave birth to Mamluks, which then was followed by Ottomans, Safavids and Mughals as army-based gunpowder empires. So this is the military slash political dimension. But the crucial center of transformation was religious. Because in the mid 11th century, Abbasid caliphs were unhappy 
with their symbolic position, like the Pope in Vatican today almost. Because starting with 945, they lost their military and political power, even in Baghdad at home. Buyids, a Shia force, captured power in Baghdad and elsewhere in Iraq and some parts of Iran. As you see in this map, around 11th century, many Shia dynasties were in controlling the Muslim world. Fatimids in North Africa, Karmatis in Arabian Peninsula, Buyids in Iraq, Iran, Hamdanis in Syria. So then what is left? Only Sunni rule in Andalus, Cordoba uh, center and other um, part of Umayyads in Andalus, and then Karanids and Ghaznavids, Turkified, Turkic, Samanism or Persianite, and Central Asia and Iberia then. So the two caliphs in Baghdad, Qadir and Qaim, declare a creed called the Qadiri creed in order, in order to unify nomadic Turkic forces in Central Asia with Sunni ulama like Mawardi and others in, around Baghdad and Sunni masses who are all around the Muslim world in Baghdad, in Damascus. Many of them were Hanbali, Hadith folks and others. So the creed was declaring the Mu'tazile, the rationalist theologians who says Islam, so, sorry, the Quran was a creation of God, not the eternal word of God. It was a creation. Therefore, the Mu'tazile became infidel apostate. Then the Shias who criticized Aisha, according to this Qadri creed, became also infidels for criticizing Aisha. And non-practicing Muslims who do not follow five times prayer daily are also infidels. So this is a declaration of orthodoxy, Sunni orthodoxy. It was first accepted by Mahmud in Ghaznavi and Mahmud destroyed some Mu'tazila libraries following the Abbasi caliphs. And then Qadir then Qayyim promote this idea and their project finally succeeded when Selçuk's came to Baghdad, ended the Buyid hegemony there, then established a Sunni empire and promoting certain ideas. And this promotion of certain Sunni Orthodox ideas was mostly done by Nizamul Mulk, the Grand Vizier or today's Prime Minister of Selçuk Empire. He established a madrasa in Baghdad called Nizamiya. Then the network of madrasas uh, was called after him as Nizamiya madrasas. And these madrasas promoted Sunni orthodoxy with certain struggles within themselves between Hanafis, Hanbalis, and Shafis. And the major product of the madrasa system and the main uh, both a product and a supporter was the genius Imam Ghazali. So Ghazali was a genius. He, on the one hand, he was very much uncomfortable because of the legacy of the early Islamic ideal of putting distance with the state. So on the one hand, at the age of 40, he had a midlife crisis, then went to the Prophet Abraham's graveyard and he took an oath. And Ghazali said, I'm taking an oath that I will never receive money from the state again. I will never have close contact with state rulers again. And I will never teach a state-based, government-based in his terminology institution again. So. Even in Ghazali, we see the reflection of early ideal of putting distance between politics, which is corrupt. But the same person, very complex person, Ghazali, served what I call ulema state alliance by attacking philosophers in his Tehafet al-Falasafa, 
especially in the last two pages, he wrote a conclusion with a hypothetical and very unfortunate question. Are the philosophers and their followers apostate to be killed? And he said, yes, for three reasons. The philosopher says the world is eternal. They say that the resurrection is physical, not uh, sorry, spiritual, not physical. And the God's knowledge is limited by major things. God is not interested in small details. So for saying this three philosophers, he says, is kafir. So apostates and they can be killed, their property can be confiscated. So toward the end of his life, Ghazali himself was attacked to be an infidel and he had to defend himself, but he never gave up the idea that Farabi and Ibn Sina are kafir or they are apostate. Even he, in his very late writing, his own autobiography, Ghazali continues the ad hominem attack to Ibn Sina and Farabi. And it has many negative consequences in terms of justifying the state persecution of philosophers. For example, Saladin uh, declared the execution of the founder of Ishraqiyun, uh, Masab or school of thought, Suhraverdi in Damascus a century after Ghazali but these are connected issues. Uh, the giant Ghazali had definitely an impact on the persecution of philosophers with the fatwa. He wrote not only in Tahafat al-Falasafa, but repeated in other books like Al-Iktisad fi Tiqat, and then his autobiography to a certain extent. So this first. The second, Ghazali also attacked Shia. He also issued a fatwa that Ismaili Shias are apostates. They could be punished by that. Plus, Ghazali quote what I quoted 10 minutes ago, and hadith about religion and state as being twin brothers. And he repeated in both Al-Iqtisad fil Tiqat and even Ihya al the Sciences, uh, religious, the revival of religious sciences, his most widely read book, and possibly the, the, the most important book in many parts of the Muslim world, even it was translated to Persian and it is a Shia version, was very popular among Shia thinkers. And Ghazali caught the maxim religion and state are twins, religion is structure state is guardian, that without structure collapse, that without guardian perishes. But this is a fabricated hadith. In fact, this is not a hadith at all. And experts of this know very well that this is a Sasanian maxim said by Ardashir in his famous testimony, Ardashir, recommended his son and other audience centuries before Muhammad that religion and state are twins. It is perfect quotation from Ardashir's testimony and translated to Arabic. Many books before Ghazali, like Masudi's history I cited in my book has these quotations. And unfortunately scholars like Ghazali and then after him Razi use this to justify ulema state alliance, this fabricated hadith, which has nothing to do with Muhammad, because of the fact that there is nothing in Islam, in Quran and hadith, to really justify ulema state alliance. That's why they fabricated this and use. So the Ghazali therefore played an important role in ulema state alliance, which had an impact in Selchuk's then spread all over the Muslim world by Saladin, by Mamluks, Ottomans, and others. So let me summarize what I try to explain so far. So the rise of ulema state alliance in the 11th century had ideological factors, Sunni orthodoxy and the Qadiri creed, and father and son, Qadir and Qayyim, 
work callous for 50 years to promote this creed, very exclusionary against Mu'tazila, Ismailis, and non-practicing Muslims. That, but it was based on an economic factors and structure of the Iqda system, which lead to state control of economy, which marginalized the merchants and cut the ties between merchants and Islamic scholars. And therefore, Islamic scholars became loyal to the state funding. They became ready to accept state servants. And then this came with the madrasa system, Nizamiya madrasas providing public funding to Islamic scholars to replace the previous funding of merchants. So the marginalization of private land ownership and private economic entrepreneurship by the ICTA system, which was complemented by the military state and the idea of conquest and the structural changes were completed by agency, Abbasi Caliphs, Selçuk Sultans, Nizami Munk, and Ghazali. So, and Nizami Madrasas were the institutional basis and the carriers of the model. And they carried the model to Syria, Palestine, and Egypt later. And the result is the marginalization of scholars and merchants and the result is the beginning of the stagnation of intellectual and economic life. So what about the invaders? So many scholars and thinkers from Namuk Kemal in the late Ottoman era to present argue that the sources of decline was external. The Mongols came from the East, Crusaders came to West, and then Timur was a continuation of Mongols, destroy cities and make Muslims decline. Again, I engage this approach very seriously. I give the numbers of millions of people killed by Mongols and the destruction of crusaders. But it is not the main explanation because after the Mongol and crusader destruction, Muslims recovered politically and militarily. Under the Ottoman, Safavi, and Mughal empires, they reached a very high level of political and military power. They also reached to a certain level of economic wealth, but they never recover intellectually. Ottoman, Safavi, and Mughals were not as developed as early Muslims in terms of philosophical vibrancy, even economic dynamics, which shows that the Mongol and Crusader invasions are not the main reason for decline because Muslims surpass them by defeating Crusaders by military heroes like Salatin. And then Mongol elite became converted to Islam. And in fact, geopolitically, Muslims reach a broader geography after these invasions, but their intellectual dynamism was very stagnant and declining because the problems began before and out of the invasions. The problems was related to the establishment of Sunni orthodoxy, spread of it by Nizamiya madrasas, represented and defended by military state system. And so aren't these invaders important? They are important. And in fact, they support my argument in the following way. When they attack, killed, massacred, large number of Muslims, millions, which empower the alliance between ulama and the military state. Because when you face traumatic attacks, you would ask for a hero, a military hero. You would ask explanation from a religious class about the hereafter, about the compensation of the massacres in the hereafter. You would not ask for good arts, music, 
philosophical skepticism, deep intellectual discussions. So that's how the Mongols and Crusaders make the military heroes and ulama's religious explanations and Sufi Sheikh's religious explanations appealing and popular in the Muslim world. That's how they contributed to decline of philosophy, decline of the bourgeoisie, and the strengthening of military and ulama elite when people facing the attack look for a military hero. And the military hero came in the form of famous Saladin. And Saladin is the one who destroyed the Fatimi Shia domination in Egypt. He is the one who established the AUB dynasty which later gave birth to Mamluks. And the Mamluks rule very long time in Egypt, around 500 years, even after the Ottoman conquest of Egypt, the Mamluks in cooperation with the Ottomans stay until Muhammad Ali Pasha. So what makes Mamluk so persistent again was related to the fact that they were the only military power who stopped the Mongol incursion because in the battle Ain and Jalut, they defeated the Mongols, which make them the hero like Saladin in the Muslim world. So that's the contribution of Mongols and Crusaders. So let me give you an anecdote about Saladin. There was the idea that Muslims destroy the library, the antique classical library in Egypt's Alexandria. So according to this story, when Amr ibn al-As, the governor and commander of Umar, the second caliph, conquer Egypt, he called Umar. So it's a joke in my normal lectures, I give many jokes, but in webinar, it's very difficult. Sorry about that. There was no phone. So he had an exchange written with Caliph Omer, then, then ask about the library. Omer said, if these thousands of books in the library are compatible with the Quran, we don't need them. We have already Quran, burn the books. If these books are contradictory to the Quran, we don't like them, burn them again. So then they burn thousands of books in about 2000 or so, baths, uh, the hammams, the bath in uh, the city. So we today know that this is a fabricated story. So it's not true that because when Amr ibn Glass came, Muslims came to Egypt, there no longer was the library, was, the library was already destroyed. There was a fire during the time of even Caesar and it was destroyed. So, but why do we have this fabricated story? Who, who fake it? Is this a Western historian? Is this an Islamophobic historian? No, it's a Muslim Arab historian who fabricated the story. Why did he do that? because his father was an advisor to Saladin. And possibly we understand today that he tried to justify Saladin's destruction of Fatima library in Egypt. Because in Baghdad, in Cairo, in Cordoba, and in many other cities, Muslims had libraries with hundreds of thousands of books. At that time, when Western Europeans had only a few hundred books in their monasteries, because Muslims had paper from 8th to 12th centuries onward. But Western Europeans did not have paper production until the 12th century. And it was very expensive to use animal skin to write books in Western Europe. They had few hundreds, but Muslims had hundreds of thousands of books using paper. When Saladin came, he found the Fatimi library in Cairo and he destroyed either by selling for money, perhaps he needed money, or he hated the fact that many of these books are Ismaili teaching and philosophy. 
And in order to justify, the Arab historian fabricated the story that Muslims already destroy a library in Egypt centuries ago. Therefore, what Saladin did was justifiable. So this is how the ulama state alliance using military achievements justify itself, dominate the Muslim world, coming from Central Asia, Iran, Iraq to Syria and Egypt. But there also was a religious justification and it was done by Ibn Taymiyyah a very famous Muslim scholar of the 14th century who reinterprets the verse in the Quran, Ulul Imri Munkum. So as I said, there was very little to justify political systems in the Quran and Hadith. That's why they fabricated the Hadith about twin brotherhood between religion and state. And even Taymiyyah played a role in interpreting this verse about following the authority. So there is a phrase in the Quran saying that, follow those who authority among you, ulul amri minkuma, those who among you having an authority. So this has various ways of to be interpreted authority based on knowledge, wisdom, authority based on certain expertise. And Mawardi defined and used this as a basis of his theory of caliphate. And about two centuries after Mawardi, since the Abbasi caliphate was already destroyed, Ibn Taymiyyah came with a new idea that Ulul Amr, those who have authority as two classes, Umara and ulama. So ulama, ulama, and the Islamic scholars, umara is the state authorities, the rulers. So then he used the Quran and interpret in a way to justify what I call ulama state alliance. And this has been until today a very influential interpretation. So as I said, Muslims, despite this, ulama state alliance, marginalizing intellectuals and bourgeoisie, continue to produce cutting edge thinkers like Ibn Rush, Ibn Haldun, but they were marginalized. Ibn Rush has, for example, a very important commentary on Plato's Republic. We read it today in English. It was translated from Hebrew because the Arabic origin was destroyed. Ibn Haldun was mostly forgotten for centuries until he was rediscovered by Western scholars in 19th century. And then Egypt had intercontinental trade maker, bourgeois class, Kerimis, Muslim and Jewish and some Christians among them. And they were marginalized by the Mamluks who took control of not only lands, but also the trade of certain items like salt. So, we have data in a Canadian historian's book, Shas Miller, 1993 book. She looks at all the recordings of markets in the Muslim world, Egypt, eastward, between eight to mid 11th century, she categorized, and then we have comparable data with the same market recordings between 12th and 15th century. And it's about occupational terms reflecting class relations. An occupational term, for example, a bank manager or a lender, broker, etc. So when we compare the two, we see that commercial terms, she find that 333 different occupational terms in the so-called golden age of Muslims. And then what I called as the stagnant era of the Seljuks and Mamluks between 12th and 15th century, it's only 220, there's a slight decline. But when we look at ulama state, the terms about their jobs 
jump from 97 to 303 in the state, jump from 33 to 118 for ulama. It shows how ulama state have resources, division of labor, functions, uh, very much detailed capacity to increase the level of occupational terms. They have so much emphasis, whereas the commercial field remains stagnant. So after the Crusaders, Mongols, Mamluks came the three Muslim empires. As I said, they recovered politically they expanded geopolitically even after the Mongol invasion. And these three empires were called by Marshal Hosson gunpowder empires. Why? Because during these two centuries, Western Europe experienced major revolutions, Renaissance, Reformation, Printing Revolution, geographical discoveries, and then coming enlightenment on the verge. It, then it was followed by political revolutions and industrial revolution. Europeans succeeded to do these revolutions by using three main instruments. They borrow from China and Bacon and Karl Marx all emphasize this three as the pillars of European progress. So two classes emerge in Western Europe. Starting with 11th century, they open universities and universities produce a class of intellectuals. And again, starting with 11th, 12th centuries in Italian city states then other parts of Europe a bourgeois class emerge. And these two classes led Renaissance, they led printing revolution. For example, Benedict Anderson in his famous book, Imagined Communities, emphasized how the bourgeoisie was behind the print revolution as print capitalism. Whereas in the Muslim world at that time, both the intellectuals and merchants were marginalized. And when Europeans were using gunpowder, nautical compass, and printing press, Muslim empires only used gunpowder because in the negotiation table, decision-making table of Muslims, metaphorically, there were the Sultan, the ulama, and the army officers. And army officers, commanders, understood the importance of gunpowder. They use it, they embrace it, they adapt and effectively use it. But nautical compass was not that much understood because only the Ottoman Empire out of the three had, a, had an effective military fleet. Safavis and Mughals were mostly army-based empires. And even Ottomans did not have a commercial fleet. They were mostly using Venetian, Genovese, then Dutch and British merchants and their collaboration instead of having their own military fleet because Ottomans didn't have a strong bourgeois class for maritime commerce. And printing press out of the three was forgotten for centuries, neglected because in there was no intellectual or bourgeois class on decision-making process. There was only ulama and ulama regarded it as a threat, as a danger. That's why there was no printing press run by Muslims in the Muslim world from Gutenberg to Ibrahim Mutafarrika from 1455 to 1729. And I criticized the Ottomans for getting the printing press very late, but they were ahead of other Muslims. In other Muslim majority places, the situation was even worse. So thinking today, anachronistically, can you imagine a country getting internet 300 years after or mobile phone 300 years after? That, that's not excusable, but in Turkey and elsewhere, whenever I talk about my book, people really try to convince me that this is normal, 
nothing abnormal. Muslims had hand manual scribing better books. But look at the numbers. I calculated the number of books printed, estimate numbers. In 18th century, Ottoman printing presses, it's around 50,000. In the same century, in Western Europe, one billion books were printed. So therefore, of course, getting printing press late was important. It is like Europe's delayed paper production. And then the question, how come Muslims who were very quick to adopt paper technology became so late and indifferent toward printing press? Another number is the literacy rate. Average literacy estimate around 1800, only 1% in the Ottoman Empire, whereas it was 31% in Western Europe. So it showed the gap historically at that time. And remember today's numbers, there is still a literacy gap, average Muslim majority and average world average. And this has historical pet dependence and the problem of literacy rate in 1800 has consequences for today. So let me conclude by saying that I am not, of course, the first to single out the problem of ulema state alliance. Many in the Muslim world were aware of the problem. They tried to change it. But they were either partially successful or they failed. The main, one main reason is that the reform attempt in the Muslim world were either very reactionary to European colonization. And this anti-colonial focus really obscure to focusing on the domestic problem of the lack of intellectuals and bourgeoisie and the focus on ulema state alliance. And this map showing the European colonization right before the First World War. And remember what I said that the colonization is a real problem, but it came after stagnation in the Ottoman, Safavi, Mughal empires and other Muslim states. Therefore, it is more an effect rather than the cause itself when we analyze the long term, long durée, the intellectual decline and economic stagnation in the Muslim world. So some reformists from Turkey's Kemal Atatürk to Egypt's Jamal Abdel Nasser, they had modernization projects but mostly failed because they were anti-intellectual and they were anti-bourgeoisie because these projects mostly top down authoritarian ran by military leaders and the military class by socialization by the class identity have a hard time to understand intellectuals and bourgeoisie and their importance and after that, in the last 50 years or so, even in countries like Turkey and Egypt with early secular foundation, emergence of ulema state alliance happened. And today in Turkey, the Diyanet, as I said, 100,000 Imam state servants and the importance of Diyanet is increasing and become deepening under the current Islamo populist regime of Tayyip Erdogan. And similarly in Egypt, initially the secular state of Nasser and Sadat tried to use the ulema against Muslim brothers, but then ulema now became more and more influential. Issue in fact was about whether uh, declaring that women cannot be the president of the country. So, and a point I want to emphasize here is that from history to present, it is always a symbiotic relationship. It is always two-way road. 
between ulama and state. That's what I, that's why I keep saying ulama state. In some cases like Iran, you may think ulama dominate. In some cases like Ottoman Empire, you may think the state dominate, but it's always a partnership, both sides receiving benefits and interests. So, and more recently, after the failed modernist attempts, after the modern uh, versions of ulema state alliance, we reach after the Iranian revolution, the establishment of Islamist regimes, Islamist parties, and despite the differences between Islamists and ulema, at the final analysis, what Islamists demand is the ulema authority to make law. And I think paramount example is Ikhwan, the Muslim brothers in Egypt. Despite their old problems with al Azhar, when Muslim brothers finally had the power to draft a constitution, they put an article to the Egyptian constitution that the High Council of al Azhar decide what Sharia is. And Sharia already was made the source of law in Egypt before Muslim brothers. And Muslim brothers drafted the constitution, giving the authority fully the ulama al Azhar. It's an example of how Islamists and ulama are overlapping, like in cases of Karadavi and Khomeini. But when Islamists get the power, they don't have an alternative way of making law. They just follow the ulama's understanding of Sharia. So let me conclude by economic structure. This agency, Ulama State Alliance, always need an external funding because neither ulama nor state is a productive class. They always need an external money and historically, it was agricultural production they dominate and use in the Iqta and Timar system and for wakufs for the madrasas and ulama. Today, it's mostly oil revenue. And in my book, I have a detailed analysis of rentier model. If a state and government receive 40% of its revenues from oil, it's a rentier state. And in this table, I summarize 28 rentier state in the world. And most of them, about three quarters of them, I think 21 or two are Muslim majority. Despite the fact that only a third of all countries in the world are Muslim majority, three thirds of all rentier state are Muslim majority and this Revenue has been used by Ulema State Alliance to reproduce itself. In cases like Turkey, where you don't have oil, rent seeking continues. Turkey is receiving money from Qatar by different means or using Istanbul's lands piece by piece, selling for construction process and projects and using as a rent source of rent Istanbul rather than oil as a source of rent. And this rentierism is very crucial to understand Ulema State Alliance today. So to conclude, Islam is not the culprit. It was perfectly compatible for four or five centuries in its early history. Colonialism is not the primary cause. It came after Muslim stagnation. Authoritarian and, and ineffective institutions are important, but they are created by agency and the agency is the ulama state alliance. They have ideology and power to create these institutions. So thanks for listening and I'll be happy to answer if there are any questions. Thank you, thank you Ahmed, that, that was uh, terrific. Uh, um, again, thank you for uh, sharing your uh, wonderful work with us. Uh, we. I just want to recognize we have about 15 minutes, so we'll, we'll, we'll get some question and answers uh, in this time. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to recognize a number of uh, faculty members who have uh, joined us. Uh, and so I just want to formally recognize them. And in, and in case any of them have a question 
uh, they can type it in the question and answer window and I'll be happy to relay that to, to Ahmed. Um, so we have, uh, we have a Professor Amani Jamal, uh, Michael Cook, Michael Reynolds, Faisal Ahmed, Swati Bhatt, and Ron, uh, Roland Benabu um, amongst us from the faculty. Um, let me um, begin by um, asking a, a question that's coming from uh, Faisal Ahmed. And uh, his question is basically about the scope of your core argument and how that applies or perhaps does not apply to countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And the reason he says that is because he says there are several Muslim majority countries today that exhibit low levels of economic development and are conflict prone and that this is the sub-Saharan African countries which were not exposed to the ulema state alliance you discuss. So the question is like, how do you explain those countries um, in terms of their current level of development? Thank you for the question. I'm sorry that the lecture takes longer than expected. Very quickly, I received questions about Indonesia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And in both Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan or West Africa, ulema state alliance is not strong. Therefore, we see many democracies like Senegal, until recently Mali, until recently Niger, Indonesia. And we see more economic development like Indonesia, Malaysia to a certain extent. And because of the uh, oil revenues depleted in Indonesia, which is uh, also a big plus, therefore the lack of ulema state alliance in both cases support the argument, provides some good example of democratization. Thank you. Um, there is um, another question about the adoption. You mentioned the early adoption of paper, but not uh, of the printing press among the Muslim world. So um, in, in your mind, what are the reasons that the paper was adopted earlier, but the printing press was not? Is it just the same argument about the um, Ulama Alliance or are there some additional factors that explain this difference because in the 8th, 9th centuries, Muslims were much more open-minded. They had a dynamic intellectual and economic classes, understood the importance of paper. They were not obsessed with conquest and military. But later on in the printing time, unfortunately, they didn't have this vibrant intellectual economic position and they were obsessed with military conquest. So I cannot imagine Ibn Sina, Farabi and Biruni knowing that something like printing press occur in Western Europe and remain indifferent. So I, I think this paper and printing press show us the difference between vibrant Muslim world versus stagnant Muslim world in later period. Thank you. Uh, there's another question about some counter um, um, hypotheses that people have uh, proposed. And one of them says that you know, geography is quite important um, about where the, the Muslim majority countries happen to sit as opposed to the Western world. Uh, do you have any? Um, yes. So that? some scholars argue that this is a sort of European miracle that it has uh, fertile lands in Europe and then many coastal areas. I agree, but neither Muslim world nor Western Europe is stagnant. If we follow a geographical determination. We cannot explain how from eight to 12 centuries, Muslim world were more developed than Western Europe because the geography were the same in both sides of uh, the world. And yes, geographically, certain parts of Muslim world were underprivileged having too much desert, North Africa, Arabian Peninsula, Central Asia, etc. But Ottomans had better geography, the Balkans, Eastern Europe. Still, they couldn't catch up with Western economic development. Therefore, geography cannot explain the Ottoman case either. Thanks. Um, one question I had was you briefly touched upon this in your talk um, when you were talking about the Christian world. Uh, you mentioned that they had certain similarities as well, of course, with the church state alliance, if you like. And what is interesting is that that time is also correlated with a lack of scientific development among the Christian world. 
So thinking about the transition of the Christian um, world from that time to the, the more secular and the time also when science really flourishes in the Western world and the Christian world, um, looking at that process, do you have a take or a sense of the ingredients that might be useful for the Muslim world to also undertake a similar transition towards scientific development? Yes, so let me emphasize that in the 16th century, Charles V, the Habsburg Emperor, tried to dominate Europe entirely. And luckily for Europeans, he was only dominate half of Europe. If he had dominated Europe under Habsburg Empire as a Catholic empire with clergy state alliance, he would have crushed the Reformation Protestants. He would have crushed certain intellectual economic development. Therefore, as you rightly says, I try to use my argument to explain both Western Europe and the Muslim world. And the Muslim world at the time was centralized authority in the Ottoman, Mughal, and Safavi cases. So for today, my suggestion is decentralization. My suggestion is to leave the obsession with centralized state authority, leave the obsession of unified religious teaching. Diversity competition is very important and use Muslims need an economic and intellectual class to lead that. So is it possible? Yes, it is possible because it happened in the history. Muslims today have quote unquote a renaissance because they had their early achievements. They don't have to imitate Western model completely. They can learn from Western model, but they have their own model in their own history, which is inspiring. So every civilization turn its roots when they have a crisis. And Muslim world now have a crisis. They have to look at the roots. Salafis, misunderstand looking the roots and trying to produce more radicalism, literal notions, but the real going back to roots will lead us less literalism, more dynamism, more creativity. And I think structurally it is possible because the oil rent is now declining and oil age will end before the end of oil as the stone age ends before the end of stones. So agency now is required to do things like economic and intellectual creativity and support those who try to do so. So just on that note, I mean, given the broader theme of your book and, you know, you, you mentioned different um, political changes, like, you know, in, in your own country of Turkey, to take one example, uh, but also elsewhere, as you, as, as you rightly mentioned, how is your uh, sort of the thesis being received in these countries, and in a way you're criticizing, right? You're criticizing them for this alliance and the negative consequences of that. That's a very serious criticism at some level. So what can you say something about how it's being received in those circles? Thank you. I was not expecting a popular uh, acceptance reaction I, because I wrote this book as a scholarly one. But I'm very happy to see that in Indonesia, there is a big interest. The book has been translated and is going to publish in Indonesian. And in social media, many people share their views with me saying that they are secular people, some Islamic groups, Nahdatul Ulema, Muhammadi, and others. In Pakistan, there is a major interest. And in Iran, a, a Persian Farsi interview with me and a book review published in a major economic magazine with the title Ulema and State Sources of Underdevelopment. So I'm surprised that it passed the censorship. And Al Ahram in Egypt published an interview with me saying that Ulema state and military state is the source of problem. It passed also the censorship in Sisi's regime, but it was in English. They say in Arabic, it would have been harder. I received little attention in Turkey where I was born. They say because of the fear of somehow Erdogan the, the, and Diyanet uh, and others, uh, the the, there is no Turkish translation in Horizon right now. There is Bosnian translation. I have followers in Balkans. They really watch, uh, there was too much interest. I think what people are interested, non-academic people, is that everybody is aware of the problem. 
and people don't want to blame Islam, but they want change. This is a very different balance. So no, none of us would want to be racist, Islamophobic, but it is time to be critical. So it is time to stop referring Edward Said and his Orientalism and blaming the critical minds as Orientalists. Uh, I, I, I'm very happy to see public reaction to the work. I'm grateful to everyone in academia and beyond academia. Um, I certainly agree with, uh, with what you said in terms of you know, critical voices needed. Um, I, I had one question on you know, you have this very interesting story of uh, Abu Hanifa, right? And how, um, what is the, 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 how he is treated basically by the ruler of the time. And if you contrast that with Ghazali, um, one might say that, look, the state was always interested, even in the golden age, it was interested in co-opting the ulama, but it was the ulama who had higher standard perhaps. And they resisted again using the, the example of Abu Hanifa. And so it's not as much that the two found it conducive to join hands after a few centuries. It was more that the state was always egging the ulama, but the earlier ulama had, you know, had, you can call it whatever uh, intellectual pride or the other argument that you made regarding the Umayyad and so on, but whatever the reason might be that it was the ulama that kept resisting for a while until you know maybe Ghazali is the tipping point and then it becomes the alliance that you are referring to. Do you, do you have any comments on that? It's, so what I understand is that it was the ulama who was putting a distance between themselves and the state, but later on they became more accepting to be the state That's right. servant. That's yeah. right. Like so, Abu Hanifa could have said yes, right? And could have could have worked for the state, but he resisted, right? Yes, definitely. So I think first there was an ideological change by the writings of Mawardi and Ghazali. They tried to transform the Muslim notion with ideas. Look, for example, in early Islamic history, egalitarianism was a key thing. And there was an emphasis on e equality of races and the rejection of the idea of nobility. But when we came to Mawardi and his book, Ahkam al Sultaniya, Mawardi argues that the caliphate should have an office, has an office of genealogy by preventing noble women get married to ordinary men. So, how, where did Mawardi get this very uh, not that is, uh, tribal, clientelistic idea, aristocratic idea? It was Sasanian Persian thought. So I have a section in the book analyzing how Persian Sasanian thought had an impact on Muslim ulama, particularly Mawardi and Ghazali, who were under the influence of them. They use the Sasanian notion of governance, but unfortunately they didn't represent them as their own views, their own time, but they represent as an Islam. And today when Muslims read Mawardi Ghazali, they think it is holy message of God. Let me, so one example is the office of nobility of Mawardi. Another example in Ibn Haldun's Muqaddimah, he says that when the prophet and four caliphs received bay'ah, the political loyalty, they were shaking hands. And bay'ah is basically a trade uh, exchange shaking hands. But he says, today and for centuries, Ibn Haldun says, we use the Sasanian notion that you kiss the foot of the king, the dress of the king, maximum the hand of the king you can kiss. You never shake because it is an offense to authority. That's the good and normal thing. So Ibn Aldun trash the prophet's tradition because he said, we have to rule by Sasani tradition. That's better, that's more reasonable. So if someone reads that today as a religious text, then the person's mind is frozen 
in the medieval notion of monarchy, which is contradictory to very original idea of Islam itself. So what is good Islam? <laughs> what is true Islam? I'm not trying to impose, but the reader's audience can decide whether ideas of Ghazali and Mawardi are true Islam or reflecting their notions. One, one more example is the class relations. The Sasanids had the class relations based on political class, clergy, then the farmers. Merchants were the lowest and despicable class. Somehow Muslims in Iran in the 10th, 11th century adopt this notion, and you can see it in Mawardi's books too, putting merchants at the lowest status. So regarding your question, my answer is that they were both a ideational transformation. Muslims lost the original idea of putting distance between the political and religious authority. Ghazali was a remnant, last representative, because of his crisis, as I said. And Mawardi Ghazali produced ideas that today, unfortunately, the English translators, the recent translation of Mawardi says, we translate the book to teach Muslim youth what real Islamic idea of politics is. No, Mawardi is a history. He cannot inspire modern youth. It's just 11th century notion. And the second thing is economy, as you rightly say, Ibn Abu Hanifa refused because he was a silk merchant. Ibn Hanbal refused because he worked for textile industry. If ulama today are part of normal life, earning money like you and I earn, they could have said no to state. But if their only monetary source, financial source is the state, they cannot be Abu Hanifa, they cannot be say no. And that's why we don't have major Islamic scholars since 15th century. The last major Islamic scholars have Taftazani and Jurjani of uh, late 14th century. Thank you so much. This is this is really fascinating, Ahmed. We could we could go on, um, but the the time is up. I do want to thank you once again for uh, for a very stimulating uh, conversation. And as you rightly said, the important thing is to discuss these very important questions with an open critical mind, using logic and evidence. And people can take whatever they like from the arguments. But I'm I'm really glad that someone. With, with your knowledge and background is, you know, is, is, is asking these very important and at the same time tough questions and then, you know, um, taking that message to the broader audience. So thank you for, for doing this. Thank you for coming here. It was a privilege having you and I'm sure, you know, people will find the recording of this uh, lecture of yours very, very useful um, in days to come. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure and honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good day.